Ah, well, I am so glad to be here today. My name is Kristen Piers. I am a practitioner here at the center. Uh, and in life, I am a coach and also a healing practitioner. And the title of our talk today is The Body Remembers. And it, it, our bodies do remember. They remember beyond what our mind remembers. And in some, in some cases, at least with my body, my body will like, have feelings or symptoms, and I don't know where that came from until I go a little deeper and inquire, like, where did that come from? Because why, why am I feeling this way? And then my mind's like, oh, yeah, that thing, that thing that happened. And so the whole context of this month is about the body. And today, it's about the rememberings that happen in the body. So as a philosophy that values the mind so much that we include mind in how we describe ourselves, science of mind, it's something we, we value, but we get to remember that the body and the mind, the mind and the body, they are inextricably interconnected. You can't separate them and have one do okay and survive. <laughs> they really do come as a, as a package. So we recognize oneness, as Margie was saying earlier. We recognize oneness. Oneness is all there is. There is no separation in the big picture between me and you, between us and other communities, between, <laughs> between this country and other countries. It's all one. And so in that zoomed out picture, humanity is all one body. And within that body, there are disagreements. There are births of nations. There are separations. There are comings together again. That's all happening within the one body. It's how we got to be here today. And then coming in some, our community, just a little bit from all of humanity back to here at Columbus Center for Spiritual Living, and the, the evolution of new thought as a tradition. Within the tradition of new thought, of which science of mind is a part, we started with, we, we, we say we started with a guy named Quimby. And from Quimby, there were other wise people who came along and that said, oh no, th this is a better way. Oh no, this is a better way until we have what we have, and we have the center. And the center itself has gone through so many evolutions and changes, separations, comings together. That's life. But what happens when we separate, come together, when things change, is there's often pain involved. There's often discomfort. There's a lot of feelings. And sometimes we don't really stop to process those feelings or we don't want to stop to process those feelings, or those feelings are so big we cannot process all those feelings. So it gets stuck. It gets stuck in the body. And at some point, it comes back. And then it comes back again. And we're like, oh, this is a new thing. It's not connected to the old thing, but really it actually is frequently connected with the old thing. As uh, I've, I've worked for 20 years with people who have chronic aches and pains and problems that just don't go away no matter what they try. And early on in my career, you know, I, I became a massage therapist. I'm like, we'll just massage this way and it'll make your shoulder all better, except it didn't. And then I learned deep tissue stretching. We'll just stretch you this way and it'll make it all better. And it didn't. Well, I'm a dietitian too, so, well, if you just change your diet and follow this exact diet, it'll get all better. Gosh darn it, not in my office. <laughs> and, and I just kept, it took me a while. You know, I catch on, but it takes a while. And I noticed that the changes that would happen with people were not necessarily in the technique I was doing with them, but in the conversations I was having with them. And it wasn't even necessarily the words of the conversations. It was the energy within the conversation. Something in me would connect with something in them, and then the pieces within them would go pop. And when I felt that pop, 
they'd get better. It was amazing. <laughs> they would get the realization they needed, and they could move on. And sometimes the realization was a really big one, that yeah, this, 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 this uh, thing that had happened, this, this um, trauma that had happened during their childhood, they, they, they made the connection from the innocent, carefree child before the trauma with their wise adult now, and the trauma finally let go. And sometimes it's just a remembering, oh, you know, this, this time last year, my cat died. Oh, that's why my body hurts. I didn't feel it all then, so I feel it now. It could be as simple as that. But the thing is, is that these aches and pains don't go away unless we pay attention to them. <sighs> so, being more specific, or differently specific, we'll say, old pain left unprocessed begets new pain, frequently in different forms. You know, remember, I don't, don't think we could forget, but remember the Black Lives Matter marches and riots from 2020. There was a lot happening that year, a lot, a lot, a lot. Those weren't just happening because people were upset about the unjust death of one person. No, that was like generations worth of oppression and slavery and, ju and just untold horrors, all coming out in that way at that time. And the communities, I as an individual, think about how can, how can I contribute to healing that? Well, guess what? We talk about it here all the time. It's healing what's here first, taking that step. And here we are as a community taking that step together because today we're talking about trauma. Not just the body remembering, but the stuck parts. And it, I, I smile, but I also deeply feel it's a matter of where my consciousness is and my energy is in any given moment. So today we're going to go between the, ah, oh, and the, hey, because what the healing is, is when the, the stuck, the dark, the, ugh, is allowed to rise and connect with the light, the inspiration, the expansiveness of the present. And sometimes it needs to go back and forth and back and forth to really work itself out. And so here as a community today, that's what I am giving permission to happen. It gets to happen however it happens in each one of us here. And it gets to happen in the community. And as much in the world as a whole, as, as we can stand. And I have gone so off my topic of script. <laughs> it's all there in front of me if I really get lost. Uh, and that's what I really wanted today, was I do need to write it down to get the inspiration to, in some linear format. But really, I wanted to see what spirit had to say today, and I offered myself as, as a vessel for that to happen. So we're on this adventure together. So I, I have an example for you. And first we're gonna talk about it, and then I'll show you. So I want you to think, like if, if you think of creation, all creation, and there's that ripple effect. Think of it like jello. And you, you ding jello, and there's nothing in the jello other than jello, and it just goes wee 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 just like that. Woo 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 woo. You wanna do it with me? Woo woo woo. <laughs> and so the jello ripples. But if you put something in the jello, the ripple goes to the thing and it stops. And there will be vibration, but that vibration is going to change, and it's going to ping back a little bit. And that's what happens in the body of trauma, of stuck pain, unprocessed. Creation's like, and then it hits something of a different density that hasn't moved. And creation's dynamic and wonderful, and it's like, oh, all right, well, we'll just spin off in all these other directions, but it's with also the resonance of that unprocessed pain. So, guess what I brought for you to look at? Yes! 
And Margie is going to bring it around so you can ping it. There you go, Margie. <laughs> Just ping it. Yeah. And so you can watch. It's lime jello. Is it green? It is green jello. Yes. So when you ping the jello, notice the ripple of the, just the jello, and notice what happens when it hits the solid object in the jello. Something happens. And uh, you may never look at jello the same again. <laughs> I also found out this morning that if you put pineapple in jello, your jello doesn't set, so it's good to have a backup. Uh, yes, thank you to my husband for saying, I'll keep that little bit of extra jello, I'll eat that. Honey, you don't want to eat this jello anymore. All right. So as, you, as, the, as the jello is proceeding around the room and, and being pinged, you can uh, anticipate that. And I'm going to start talking a little bit more about, oh, we can't even see this image very well. Hey, Matt, can you turn down the lights so we can see this image a little bit? So uh, this image that I have on the screen it might look manufactured, but it's not. What it is, is it's the pyramids in, uh, of Giza in Egypt. And this was a photo taken by a spiritual tour guide uh, named Islam Radi. And he posted this a couple weeks ago, and he said he was uh, doing his work at the pyramids. And the por this is a portal. And the portal, <laughs> and I'm, I'm hearing discussion about what, what that trauma is in the jello. <laughs> and uh, we'll get back to that later. Thank you. So the pyramids in Giza <laughs> in Egypt. Uh, he, was, he was doing his work at the pyramids, and the, a portal opened up right behind the pyramids. And... Can you imagine being somewhere and this opens up in the sky? I, I was like, oh my goodness. And he says he has not altered the photo at all. And I, I choose to believe that. And he said, now you could just go ahead and put that on the table, thanks. If, you, if anybody needs to refer to that for reference, go right ahead. Uh, <laughs> so... What Islam said is it, it's a portal, and it opened, and then after a little bit, it went away again. And he posted the picture, and he's like, what do you folks know about what this is? And then another friend of mine who's actually been to the pyramids, she's from the United States, but she's recently been to the pyramids. She travels the world and studies uh, ancient energies. And she said that on June 7th was when um, the Earth went through an energy upgrade. It was, I guess it was a scheduled energy upgrade that her tradition's aware of, and this was when the portal opened up. I, I'm like, wow. So regardless of how you interpret this photo, I look at it and I feel more expansive. I feel hope, I feel curiosity, awe, interest, and mystery. And so we as science of minders consciously enjoy exploring in that gap between logic and mysticism. And this is that in that gap. Logic, don't know how it works. Mysticism, that's pretty cool. And somewhere in there, that's where we get to play. That's potential for elevation, expansion, drawing us from where we are into new possibilities of understanding, feeling, and experiencing. So moving more deeply into this next phase of our talk, we're going to talk about trauma. And so a word for the painful experiences that I've been speaking about is trauma. And sometimes long after the brain has put an experience in storage, a stimulus comes along that lights that, that, lights that old pain up, and then for some people, all hell breaks loose. Maybe you've had that happen. Uh, someone saying something relatively benign to other people's ears hits you, and you find yourself seeing red and blowing up. I know that's happened with me. 
what's happened there is there's an old pain. And that person, by whatever they said or who they're being, pinged that pain, and your brain just went zoom. And perhaps stuff came out of your mouth after that. And that, that kind of reaction is rooted in trauma. A few other examples are that I've seen in my office is that a few years after the death of a loved one, sometimes people develop a really painful thing in their body, like crippling low back pain that doesn't respond to treatment. Where did that pain come from? When I talk with these people, sometimes it's like it's around, it, that pain appears around the same time that that loved one died. And when they start understanding that, it brings back the grief, it brings back the things they couldn't deal with when it happened, and that's where their healing begins. So, returning to the quote from the beginning of service, trauma isn't what happens to you, it's what happens inside you in response to what happens to you. So, Dr. Mate is a physician. He's an expert in the field of psychological trauma, stress, and addiction. And when I saw this, it was actually at my chiropractic office that I saw this quote. I'm like, yeah, because experiences themselves are benign. We can judge it as good, bad, wonderful, terrible, but an experience is an experience. How we react to it based on our thoughts, feelings, beliefs, judgments, that's what causes the problems, or it's not, could cause us problems. It's, once again, our reactions aren't necessarily bad. Those can also be neutral, but if that reaction causes um, real hurt to others, that might not work so well. So, let's see, all experiences impact us. It's our nervous systems that take in that information. And on the surface, our brains interpret the stimulus as best they can, while under the surface, all kinds of signaling happens to evaluate current safety and to put safeguards in place in case this ever happens again. So that's another thing that happens with trauma. Something, tr something big happens, your body's like, oh my gosh, I'm not safe. Let me put all the bells and whistles and alarms on set in case something else tries to break through that sounds, feels like, smells like that, and then that button gets pushed in the future. Even if it's not, the, not dangerous, our bodies can over, our nervous systems can overreact to that, which perpetuates the problem. <sighs> so many times when experiences happen that we can't or cho don't choose to fully process, all of the thoughts and feelings and emotions that those experiences stir up um, come back. And who has trauma patterning? So based on all that I've said, who has trauma patterning? <gasps> Raise your hand if you're human. Because if you have been born, <laughs> if you've known somebody who's died, if you've been present for anything going on in this world, if your lineage has been through anything traumatic, you also likely have patterning because patterning can get inherited. Isn't this great news? Yay! Ah, okay. So we all can have trauma patterning. For some of us, it's, we can live with it and have a pretty good life. Some of us, not so much. And so I want to go into, we're going to do this much to the biology of trauma because there's whole books on this. But I want to read this because I want to make sure you get it. I get it right. In a full-blown trauma reaction, the amygdala and sympathetic nervous system, that's the fight or flight, fire up and release signals for fear and or aggression, while logical judgment, self-observation, and compassion are suppressed. All these processes are happening, and then digestion is also stopping, so blood can go to the appendages to prepare for fighting or fleeing, and as a last-ditch resort, freezing. For many of us, what I've said before, trauma doesn't elicit a full-blown reaction, but it still can be there. An ache, a pain, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, chronic illness, overreactions to benign experiences, those are all potentially rooted in trauma. So <laughs> when I, I've been doing this, this trauma release work most of my adult life, but I'd never used the word trauma for it. 
I hadn't been hearing the word trauma until maybe the last year or two, and I didn't give any thought to it because nobody said, you know, this, Kristen, this is how this connects to you. So when I uh, accepted this topic and read about trauma, I'm like, oh, that's me. And, and then I brought this up with a psychologist friend of mine, and she's in her 80s. She's still practicing. And she's like, oh, yeah. She's like, I just used to, like, I've always worked with people that would have what you'd call trauma now. But I didn't think about it like that. That's just the problems people had, and I helped them get through it. But now, the shift in consciousness is there's a word for it. And when there's a word for it, it becomes more real. Then it gets researched. And strategies for getting through it get figured out. It's not that everybody, that, that every strategy will always work. But the thing is, is now that we have a word for it and we have research and we have validation, more light gets shed into possibility for healing and transformation and change. Just one word. Create it's a big shift. <sighs> so what can be done to help heal from trauma? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> we are so set up here uh, as, as spiritual humans. We are, we are so set up here, too, within Science of Mind at Columbus Center for Spiritual Living because we already use a lot of the tools that are effective for helping release trauma. And so this is Kristen's five steps of information, and there's so much within the steps. So number one, we have belief. We, in Science of Mind, believe we have the power to choose the, des the experience we want to have. Not everybody thinks that. Some people think if you get the green jello on your plate, that's what you've got. That's the experience of your life. Here, we don't believe that. We believe that if you want a different experience than the, the constant panic attacks, you can choose to set your mind to creating that experience in your life. So belief. If you want to get, have a new experience separate from the trauma, then you get to believe it, believe it's possible. Number two is desire. Desire for the new experience is the fuel that will keep you moving. You, you could believe it, but it doesn't mean you're actually gonna like add energy to it. Desire means like, wait a second, I can conceive of a life where I feel peaceful and at ease. Oh, I can conceive of a life where I feel peaceful and at ease. I really want that. That's not that interesting. I can conceive of a life that I feel peaceful at, in, at ease, and deeply loved, and so I have so much fun. Yes. If I can imagine that and it starts to move and bubble and fizz within me, that's going to help me do the work to have the experience I desire. And then three, my third step is receptivity. As spiritual people, we talk about being receptive all the time. However, it is the practices that allow us to be receptive that set us up for actually receiving. So the practices we talk about that support receptivity are, get them in your head, meditation, vocalization, movement, nature, setting, these are all, these are just some of the practices that set us up for being receptive. Being receptive is partly just a decision. I'm going to open myself and allow information to come in. Usually this involves stillness, but not always. We don't know. I don't know for you. So receptivity is a hugely important part of moving through trauma in a way that works for you. Because a dozen different professionals could tell you a dozen different ways, but it doesn't mean that that's your way. And here we believe we're connected with spirit. And spirit 
can direct through our wisdom what's right for us on our path to have that experience we want. But first, we got to show up to do the practices. And in my life, I didn't show up to do the practices until I got really stuck and nothing else was working. And then it's like, gosh darn, I guess I'll meditate. But the thing was, that's the, that was the change. Everybody I talked to to help me solve my problem, my trauma, didn't, they shared their way, but they didn't know the way for me. But when I sat myself down and committed to that receptivity practice called meditation, that's when I started receiving <laughs> the information I needed. The book I needed with the information I needed showed up in my hands. The yoga practice that has brought me so much joy showed up on my Facebook feed. And it's like, oh, oh, wow. And I got interested, I got excited, I tried it out and I stuck with it. So those receptivity practices are very important in that road to trauma release, freedom into what we desire. The next step though, is once we receive it, we get to engage with it. I could just see that yoga practice showing up on my Facebook page and be like, oh, that's interesting, cool. But if I don't engage with it, I don't get anything from it. So that's, that's that, that next step, is the engagement is another place where deep healing can happen and it's not always comfortable. I'll tell you that now. Because a lot of times, the reason the trauma got lodged in us in the first place is because it was uncomfortable. We didn't like how it made us feel. We didn't like how it made us think. Well, that comes back when we're engaging with the healing. But you know what? You've got that carrot of desire on the other end. You know what you want. Is it, so, is it worth it to go through and engage? <sighs> and we're rounding the bend here into honoring. Step five, in the space of honoring, we recognize that our process is our own and we honor it. We recognize that our past is our own and we say thank you. And we take a look at our future and we honor that we're on that road, honoring. So, today, as Margie mentioned, in the United States, it's the holiday of Juneteenth the celebration of the emancipation of enslaved persons. Our history is still very much intertwined with our present. The grief, the pain, the oppression, all of it has left behind collective and individual trauma. By healing our individual experiences and traumas, we can begin to unwind the patterning of trauma that continues to create pain and grief in the lives we have now. So we can't heal what we've refused to look at, to feel, and to process within ourselves. So now, we're going to do an exercise together. And it's a trauma release technique called shaking. So stand up, we get to do this together. And first, we're gonna do this with no music, just to, I wanna demonstrate how to shake, because we might have forgotten. And so make your knees a little bit bouncy, and bounce, bounce, then, Feel for your shoulders to bounce. Let, those, let every joint in your body begin to bounce. Notice what's not bouncing. See if you can get that to bounce too. Okay, so now we're shaking together, excellent. Next step is I'm gonna ask you to either close your eyes or put your gaze down on the floor. The reason being that this is a feeling experience. This is a not a comparison do better than experience. Okay, so now we're going to have a few minutes of musical accompaniment, and we're just going to shake. Keep your eyes closed or on the floor, and feel your body. When the music stops, you can come to a stop as well. Do your very best. Move your bodies. Don't move to the music. Move to what's in you. Connect to something that feels, that feels within you. 
What do you feel? Can you connect into being angry? To being sad? Do you have something within you that you know is just waiting for your attention? Shake. Feel. Breathe. Move your hands, shake them out. Move your knees. Breathe. Get it out. Take more, more. Notice if you're afraid. <sighs> Come into stillness, keep your eyes closed and breathe and notice. Notice your body. Notice your feelings. Notice if something's changed. Do you feel a part of your body more than you did before? Is there a feeling that's present? Just notice. Inhaling. And exhaling. And now we're going to have one more experience with more music. And this time, let your body move however it desires. Keeping your eyes closed. And taking that movement into prayer right now, continuing to stand. And if you desire, you can continue moving, allowing the spirit to flow through, knowing that everything, everything is all connected. There is no separation. Each and every person here and everywhere is connected into that one. And it is wonderful. It is lovely, and I am so grateful because within that there is the love and the grace and the flow. There is belief and desire and receiving and engagement and honoring all. I am so grateful to be a part of that and to know that each person here is a part of that, the healing, release, embracing the goodness is available. 
I am so grateful. I lift it up. I let it go. And so it is. <laughs>